Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Jose Pablo Ampudia, and I'm honored to be your moderator in today's discussion on organized crime in Latin America. First and foremost, I would like to express my gratitude to the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and the rest of the organizing organizers for making this insightful panel possible. Over the next minutes, we will delve into crucial aspects of this complex issue with the expertise of our distinguished panels, whom I'd be delighted to introduce. Uh, Fausto Carvajal Glass is the, fa is the founder and associate of Delphi Solution and Strategic Services. He holds a BA in International Relations from Universidad Iberoamericana and a master's degree uh, in World Studies from King's College London. He has extensive experience working with the Mexican government and his current research focuses on the global power competition and hemispheric security nexus. Dr. Damian Saik is an associate professor in criminology at Utrecht University. He obtained his PhD in 2001 from the University of Amsterdam and has conducted extensive research on organized crime and drug trafficking. Today, he will discuss his research on cocaine trafficking through the Paraguay Paraná uh, Hydroway. Sara Hirsch completed her Master of Public Administration at the Center for Research and Teaching in Economics, El CIDE, in Mexico City. She is currently a social science research professional at Stanford University, where she investigates health outcomes of gun violence, along with other topics at the intersection of health and public security. Today, she will be sharing her research on cost effectiveness of intelligence and policing strategy, and policing strategy sorry, for combating firearms in Mexico. Last but not least, Juan Corredor is a political sociologist currently pursuing a PhD in political science at City University of New York. His research focuses on comparative politics, criminal and political violence, as well as on environmental politics. Juan will be sharing his research on ethnic civilian resistance under criminal territorial control in rural areas of Colombia and Mexico. As for myself, I'm a recent graduate of Columbia University, where I completed a master in public administration, specializing in security policy, and I currently work at DAI in its United States government projects in Latin America team, specifically in the governance, security, and justice sectors. And well, before we delve into our discussion, I'd like to provide a brief and general overview of some of the issues Latin America currently faces. In recent years, the region has confronted an array of challenges from poverty and inequality to political instability. Yang, yet among these, one of its most pressing concerns is, of course, security, which is closely linked to our topic today, the complex web of organized crime. Just to put matters in perspective, a recent study by the University of Chicago revealed a staggering reality that nearly 80 million people across 18 Latin America countries live under the influence of criminal governance. This alarming statistic, of course, underscores the urgency of today's conversation. Moreover, in 2021, Latin America faced the highest regional homicide rate in the world, with more than 19 homicides per 100,000 people, nearly double of the World Health Organization threshold for endemic violence. This trend, coupled with the surge of illicit trafficking of drugs, humans, and weapons, among many other variables, which will be addressed by our, by, by our panelists, have exacerbated the existing challenges and hampered the opportunities for growth and peace. Also triggering, of course, democratic backsliding, human rights violation, and a profound impact on Latin American economy. Sectors like tourism and trade have been badly affected, impeding uh, economic prosperity, and in turn, providing fertile conditions for the growth of organized criminal organizations, both in numbers and capability. Understanding these pressing concerns is vital as we explore the dimensions of organized crime in Latin America today. And so I am pleased to start the conversation with our esteemed panelists, uh, panelists who will shed light uh, on various aspects of this, of this topic. Just as a quick reminder, each panelist will have 13 to 15 minutes to share their findings and insights leaving in enough time uh, for the audience's questions. And well, without further ado, let me turn to you first, Fausto. And based on your experience in the nexus between global power competition and hemispheric security, I'm particularly interested in hearing your insights on the current state of affairs, challenges, and potential strategies, while of course sharing with us some of the findings of your research on this topic. So please, I turn to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Pablo. 
Well, uh, first of all, I am extremely happy to be part of this uh, of this panel, and uh, particularly to discuss my research on on what I call the uh, strategic competition hemispheric security uh, nexus. Now, without further ado, because uh, time is is limited, indeed, uh, I would like to get straight to the beginning of things. And uh, most of the time, when it comes to conducting research, uh, it all comes to it all starts with a question. So um, allow me to kick off with, with this question. Uh, how does great power competition uh, between uh, the United States and China influence trends in social unrest, uh, political violence, and organized crime dynamics in Latin America and the Caribbean? And this was the founding uh, question uh, while conducting other, other research. So although it is becoming increasingly visible, um, I would argue that the uh, global power competition hemispheric security nexus remains quite uh, unexplored in national and international uh, scholarship, but more importantly, uh, be because we need to produce actionable research um, in risk assessments and therefore in the policymaking process. Um, in essence, I, I argue that uh, the great power competition between um, um, uh, the United States and China is exacerbating uh, voluntarily or involuntarily uh, pre-existing dynamics of instability, uh, violence, and uh, conflict drivers in the region in Latin America. So by and large, um, there are two key variables that uh, pave the way for this phenomenon. The first one is the uh, historical operation of uh, violent non-state actors in the region, but particularly chief among them criminal groups, and B, uh, the existence of strategic natural resources uh, and environmental commodities that are strategic in areas of limited state presence or uh, limited statehood, as Risa would put it. And on the other hand, um, these areas are characterized by extra legal governance uh, arrangements among criminal actors and state actors. Um, in addition, these local dynamics of conflict, uh, large scale violence and high intensity uh, criminality have ramifications at multiple levels of uh, analysis. So uh, for the record, this is a multi-level uh, analysis research. So um, I'm gonna expand on this multi-level uh, essence of the research. The first one and the, the more local level, um, it impacts to democratic governance, uh, citizen security, and uh, sustainable development, as I said, at the local level. Um, this is so because organized crime groups acquire um, what I call a geopolitical dimension, and this research refers to as the micro-geopolitics of organized crime. And also, these uh, uh, organized crime groups get involved in logics of violence and local power dynamics, or um, what my research calls uh, the political trajectory of criminal violence. In consequence, and this is uh, the uh, a more uh, middle level or national level uh, implication, uh, large scale violence on a local scale shapes uh, the security env environment and policies at uh, national scale, causing the use of armed forces, for instance, but also potential human rights violations and a uh, general perception of weak or failed states governments. And finally, in a more um, a macro level, um, I would argue these uh, strategic competition um, hemispheric security nexus is a, a global security threat as it becomes a potential factor of, um, of escalation uh, between the United States and China, even more so uh, in a region that has been a sphere of influence of, of the former of, of the United States. Albeit, uh, China has rapidly increased its uh, engagement in Latin America and the Caribbean in recent years, uh, both politically and 
economically, but also technologically. So these kind of, um, these might drag both superpowers into a more over uh, confrontation, thus uh, shortening the path towards what is uh, commonly known as uh, the Thucydides trap. So perhaps uh, it is important to expand on, on, on the rationale and the pertinence of this research. Um, and beyond any value judgment, and perhaps this is one uh, particular asset researchers of the Global South have um, with regards to this phenomenon, uh, it is worth acknowledging a pattern um, found in different cases of strategic competition throughout history. And this is that when a new great power increases its activity uh, in a region that has historically been the sphere of influence of another great power, well, uh, the balance of power um, in that region is inevitably upset. This not only means the displacement of the strategic competition between both powers to a specific region, but also um, the creation of new conditions for uh, political instability, social unrest, and um, certainly large-scale violence and conflict and other phenomena associated to, to, the, to, these, to these dynamics within these uh, regions' countries. So concretely, um, it should be noted, and this is no, no, no secret to anyone, that uh, no emerging power has challenged the uh, balance of power in the region as much as China has, has done today, as COPE and that, um, by the way, that the Soviet Union could have could not have dreamed of uh, in its wildest dreams during the Cold War. So this is another level of, of uh, not only uh, influence, but also uh, of power in the region. In particular, um, I would like to focus the, or to highlight that the uh, procurement of supply chains associated to, to strategic natural reaches will be the uh, actual strategic competition between the, the, the US and China in the Western hemisphere, particularly Latin America, thus becoming a potential driver of more instability, um, uh, large scale violence and criminal dynamics in Latin American countries. And this is where uh, criminal groups in particular, but other violent non-state actors in general, step in as, as critical actors as, as they may be employed as brokers or enforcers or proxies to gain access to these strategic uh, natural resources. So um, in sum, uh, well, indeed the influence of this strategic competition in the evolution and trends of organized crime in Latin America will uh, certainly depend on each country's uh, specific trends. However, uh, by and large, there are six structural variables that I would like to mention that may um, that can make the region all the more uh, volatile. Um, and, the, and these are well social unrest. Uh, economic uh, insufficient economic growth, uh, corruption, institutional weakness, uh, political upheaval, and of course, um, criminal dynamics in the region. So um, I, I will leave it here for now, uh, uh, but thank you very much for your attention and um, particularly for your uh, moderation of the problem. Thank you very much, Fausto. I think your intervention was Super, super interesting, particularly the local implications of global power competition, which at some moments might be overlooked in the grand scheme of things. So thank you very much for, for sharing with that. And uh, Damian, let me turn to you and your research on cross-border uh, organized crime, which is uh, incredibly relevant, not only for today's discussion, but uh, as uh, for uh, academic analysis. And I would ask, if you could share some recent developments and their implications for Latin America, as well as the significance of cocaine trafficking through the Paraguay uh, Paraná Highway. Thank you very much, Damien. Thank you, Pablo. 
Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. On February 2021, middle of the pandemic, uh, the largest cocaine shipment uh, ever sized in Europe arrived to Hamburg port. It did not come from Colombia or from Venezuela or from Ecuador or from Brazil that it uh, has mo many, most of the others, but it came um, from this um, Paraguay Paraná hydroway. This is um, an hydroway, it's a very interesting name given by governments and the agro-export uh, sector to the, to the river uh, Paraguay Paraná, uh, which has 3,400 kilometers, many, many ports, um, so the cocaine uh, came through um, Paraguay and then uh, after Buenos Aires uh, reached Europe. Um, so basically, I would like today to tell you something about a project I started at, uh, in February, uh, where I spent now some months in, in, in the Paraná River, uh, on blue crimes in the Paraguay Paraná uh, Hydroway. Uh, this I do also in collaboration with the Prefectura Naval Argentina, who opened me many, many doors. I basically wanted to know what are the blue crimes uh, in, uh, in the Paraguay Paraná Hydroway and how are they interconnected and what are the criminogenic drivers behind it, these crimes. Blue crimes, what is that? Basically, it's all the crimes being committed in the maritime and, and, and uh, fluvial environments, uh, which include, of course, not only organized crime and tra traditional transnational organized crime, but also environmental harms and crimes, uh, green criminology, but also port and maritime security. Um, so I wanted to explore how these three things are connected with each other, and this is what I'm doing now. And of course, this is uh, uh, undergoing. I visited many port facilities in the area and conducted until now uh, 20 interviews with various experts um, from police, custom officers, judges, uh, port, port directors, etc., etc. So um, basically the hydroway, uh, the Paraná Paraguay hydroway uh, is, um, is a long, it's a long river changing shapes and changing different environments. And it has many ports from this kind of ports uh, in uh, Bolivia, for example, uh, or in Paraguay, uh, which is, by the way, this port is the one that um, dispatched this, the 16 uh, tons of cocaine to Europe, but also has ports like uh, this one uh, where all the barges are arriving or more, um, Agro, agro export ports eh, where grains and cereals are being uh, loaded, uh, or for example, very urban port like the one in Rosario uh, with, with silos and with terminals uh, also for containers. This is a very important one, Zarate, eh, eh, also very much containers. There are more than 20 ports in the area of Rosario, um, many of them privatized, many of them actually given to other countries. Uh, the whole river is actually in a way treated as a highway. So there are tolls, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of privatization taking place there. Um, basically, I will not be bothering you much with statistics, but let me tell you that 86.3% of all agro is industrial exports from Argentina uh, uh, go through this river, particularly from the Great Rosario area, and uh, these uh, exports have increased in the uh, last 20 years um, substantially. Um, basically, I found four types of blue crimes, and I'm studying now their interconnections. Uh, let me first uh, tell you then the large and informality and illegality around uh, agro exports. That's one body of crimes. Then we have large cocaine exports to Europe mainly. Then we have uh, agrochemicals in uh, the water, uh, water pollution. And then of course, something that we have seen in Brazil uh, too, uh, um, burning of wetlands, uh, threats of wetlands by many, uh, uh, well, I will argue that all these things are connected with each other, but today I will only focus on the relationship between 
the agro exports and the cocaine exports. And that's why the name of this presentation is Soy and Coke. Let me just go through quickly on findings that I'm making now. First, regarding the import export of uh, of uh, sorry import export of agricultural products. As I said before, there is a large informality and illegality around agro exports. This can be seen first of all by an extended practice of under invoicing exports and, un and over invoicing uh, imports. So this is a classic uh, construction to export things uh, not being noticed. Also, we have a lot of ghost export companies made by real ones uh, for tax evasion and capital flight. Some of them both in different jurisdiction, of course, uh, but ingenious constructions uh, made by agro exporters to actually export without being without declaring that they are exporting this mainly because they don't want to pay taxes on that also uh, through the river there are a lot of ad hoc natural ports without permits to function S several points where this soy is being exported uh, there are also small smuggling operations from Argentina, including fake export imports to and from Paraguay, Brazil, and Uruguay from Argentina and to Argentina. Uh, so actually, we, we are used to talk about cocaine smuggling, but there is a, a huge issue about soy smuggling operations. Uh, we have um, identified a lot of uh, illegal airstrips in fields that that uh, are connected with the agro sector, um, certainly in private property. Then we have, of course, uh, very well-known cases in which companies export, main export companies in Argentina have uh, became, uh, well, I, I produced a fraudulent bankruptcy. And this is a particular case, eh, Vicentin case, for those who know Argentina will know this uh, case, very well known. Uh, we can also um, indicate that um, a lot of these grains are being uh, piled for stock, piled for price speculation, of course. There is a lot of document digital fraud or irregularities with transports, for example, putting labels of damaged soil when it's not, et cetera, et cetera. So many of these things happen uh, there. And of course, all the money for the smuggled soy uh, has to be laundered and is laundered in several places in Argentina, particularly Rosario, and particularly in this, what we call caves, uh, currency exchange caves. Also extensive use of corruption, um, systematic use of bribery, particularly between exporters and politician judges and between transporters and police. These are the two types of a lot of this uh, corruption and, and again to just let things pass and finally i would uh, want to indicate the, the weak state control on uh, places like this you can see in this picture for example how containers are um are uh, very hardly have any any places where they can be um, when, when they are controlled basically so we control or no control in some cases so the second blue crime that I would like to indicate here and I would like to show is this large uh, um, uh, increase of mega cocaine shipments since 2010, particularly. So I have been documenting and trying to get all of uh, information about all of them, uh, particularly from cocaine coming from Bolivia and Peru. But since 2006, very interesting thing that these ships uh, go more to the north of Europe, so Antwerp, Rotterdam, uh, Hamburg, rather than to Spain, which was traditionally the way, the, 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 the thing to send uh, cocaine. So I find this very clear in the patterns of the cocaine leaving Argentina going north, particularly related again with the agro export. Um, what I found also are international networks, no cartels, no presence of the PCC in Argentina until now. Um, various 
kind of changing uh, networks of Europeans and Latin Americans working together uh, and using Argentinian people as facilitators in this uh, meeting. But a lot of Europeans coming to Argentina rather than, than people from here going there to organize the shipments. Also strong intermediation and logistic functions by agro -expo entrepreneurs and employees ports and customs uh, staff, uh, various cases like, for example, Shanahan um, case in Rosario, who was the, press, the, the, the director of the port uh, laundering money for the narcos. Uh, and finally, also a lot of the cocaine is being stashed and found, of course, and moved with legal agro-industrial exports, same places, are found with cocaine and, uh, and agricultural products. Um, well, I would skip this of the three, three main routes of the cocaine coming to this uh, place. Eh? You, some new, some old, but basically I found three ways in which the cocaine makes it to the ports. We have limited law enforcement, few resources, limited in many ways, we are very highly dependent when we are talking about we is mainly the Argentinian uh, law enforcement uh, agencies dependent on foreign intelligence, particularly the DA and the European intelligence. Um, there is an active resistance of the agro export sector for more control of these shipments and the either way three treaty between the countries is also limiting the ways in which controls can be, um, for example, if the cocaine comes from, if the goods come from Paraguay and does not stop in Argentina, Argentina has no jurisdiction to control these things, which makes the either way really a kind of uh, place for moving anything you want. Finally, and with this, I will finish, uh, Pablo. I want to just uh, summarize that basically I found four drivers uh, explaining why these in cocaine exports have increased in Argentina. First, the hydroway privatization that took place in the 90s and the deregulation of the highway. Um, that, of course, has been uh, attacked by the state at attempts to regulate uh, and to, for example, collect taxes from agro exports, which has resulted in an increase in informal and illegal practices of agro-export businesses, which has actually uh, give uh, um, is one of the main drivers for cocaine uh, exports. Also, the treaty of the higher hydro way and the law enforcement limitations is a driver for the increase of large ex cocaine exports. And finally, we can mention the displacement of from other uh, established uh, routes that found now in the Paraná, Paraná River, a good way to export cocaine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Damian. It was very interesting to listen to your insights on the relation of two products that we, or at least I don't usually analyze or think about together. And if I remember correctly, commodities and soy in particular are, uh, represent one of the most important sectors of Argentinian economy. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. It was very interesting. And well, let me turn to you, Sa, with your expertise in health outcomes of gun violence and illicit markets. And I think we're all keen to listen to your insights on the cost effectiveness of intelligence and political strategies for combating firearms in Mexico. So please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, here, let me share my presentation. Here we go. So as a, I, when working with uh, firearm violence and firearm trafficking, um, I've seen a important gap in the literature where we don't, we, we tend to talk about whether it exists, where it exists, um, how bad the problem is, you know, but uh, there's no, there still hasn't been a very highly developed com conversation about uh, what exactly the best strategy is to combat it, and also um, the differentiation in uh, in the phenomenon and how it presents in terms of territory and also violence. So 
as a background for anyone who's unfamiliar, um, the flow of illegal firearms from the US to Latin America is one of the largest in the world, in particular in Mex from the US to Mexico, where it's been estimated around 213,000 firearms flow over the border per year. Um, and in 2019, 70% of the firearms found in hands of organized crime in Mexico were from the United States. So this is this is a an enormous problem that is facing Mexico. It has come to the attention of the public and the government, and it is um, it's it's a difficult problem to solve uh, because of conflicting uh, legal systems, but it is definitely worth our attention. Um, and the the perspective that I offer here is that. Um, Firearm trafficking is not a uniform phenomenon. It is. It has different presentations in different places and under different contexts. And uh, with that context, with that idea, it's important to treat each of those uh, different contexts with a different strategy. So in um, in formulating it, kind of like a like a supply chain, um, as many of these uh, transnational trafficking organizations uh, and flows are. Uh, we have in very broad terms, we have uh, places of manufacture or where the uh, weapons are uh, gathered and put together. We have transportation areas where the weapons are moved. And then we have uh, active areas where these weapons are used um, for, uh, in Mexico, particularly uh, cartel civilian violence or mainly cartel cartel violence. So there are different ways to combat uh, any kind of crime phenomenon. Uh, two of two of the probably the biggest categories are policing and intelligence. I use intelligence rather than investigation because investigation can come um, ex ante or ex post uh, the crime. So I use intelligence just to be a little bit more specific. And policing has pros and cons. It's um, some of the pros is that it is flexible. It can, you know, it finds guns in any context where there might be guns. So uh, transport crime, uh, domestic violence, homicides, um, drug busts, et cetera. However, um, some of the downfalls of that is that it's a responsive strategy. Uh, the, the, the gun already has to be ha have used generally. It, it has to have been sold. It has to be in somebody's possession. There has already been a crime committed and then the police picks it up. Um, and also it is difficult, more difficult to piece out uh, different sections of policing organizations in order to treat this issue. Intelligence, on the other hand, uh, is more directed. When I say intelligence, I'm not talking about strategic um, international intelligence. I'm talking about criminal intelligence, uh, which is the identification of patterns and uh, formulation of strategies and, um, and specifically uh, targets to uh, uh, deconstruct those patterns. Um, so the some of the the pros of an intelligence strategy are that it's much more directed, um, much more much easier to do piecemeal to section off a portion of the organization to de dedicate it to um, something specific. And unfortunately, some of the drawbacks are that um, intelligence, of course, is going to miss things like domestic violence, um, you know, neighborly disputes. Uh, you know, uh, crimes that are more um, uh, diverse in their origin. So there's also the possibility of creating, uh, developing a policy to confront this issue that mixes policing and intelligence, basically uh, using, um, first identifying the uh, characteristics of a region uh, whether that be, I mean, ideally, it could be on a municipality level. I've done it on a state level because of the data available. Uh, but basically identifying uh, where where there's more likely to be violence, 
where there's more likely to be trafficking and where there's a mixture of the two. And this is under the um, this framework of a supply chain. And where, of course, where there's more trafficking to use primarily intelligence strategies, where there's more violence to use um, either primarily or a mixture of policing and intelligence strategies. Um, and where there's neither, you know, let's not, <laughs> let's not uh, go above and beyond for, for, for spending on this. Um, so what I did is uh, I used uh, methods in the decision sciences, which are, um, they are methods that use um, game theory, statistical distribution, cost-effective analysis in order to uh, determine different thresholds, different points of decision, uh, the exact, uh, compare different decision alternatives in a way um, that allows us to look at very different uh, scenarios and compare them. So this this involves uh, generation of 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 parameters, um, which in this case, uh, well, I'll get into that in a minute. But um, so I I determine parameters and proxies when necessary. Um, the decision sciences are also helpful when working with a limited data set, which, of course, when we're talking about trafficking, because of how difficult it is to measure and how difficult it is to get a hold of the data, this was very helpful. Um, I created an index to test the presence of um, the different stages of the supply chain in different areas. And then I developed a decision tree that follows this probabilistic pathway in order to determine uh, which strategies would have the best effect uh, for the lowest price in which areas. And then I ran a uh, probabilistic sensitivity analysis in order to get a, a general idea of how these variables might change and how they might interact when they change. So I will skip uh, this in detail because of because of time, but there these are this is um, a very brief summary of the strategies I used in order to um, collect this data. And so the first result that um, that we have, and I'll explain this a little bit. The base case is the case that we is the what's what's being done now right which is according to my consultations with with experts in the field um, about uh 20 percent of arms of firearms are picked up by intelligence efforts and about 80 percent are picked up by the police uh the no test strategy to the left is in a ideal world where uh, we could change that proportion to make 50% uh, picked up by intelligence, 50% by police. Um, and then the test is this uh, other policy that I developed, which would create a test um, to determine the stage of the supply chain that the area is in before determining whether it will be a mainly an intelligence focus, a shared uh, policing and intelligence focus, or uh, solely a policing focus. So what this tells us um, in brief terms, so on the y-axis, we have the cost, and on the x-axis, we have the utility, which is how many firearms are picked up. And so what this tells us is that um, the testing strategy both it picks up more firearms for less money. So that means that it strongly dominates both the base case and, and this other uh, potential situation where intelligence takes more of a role. And this is uh, looking at this with a probabilistic sensitivity analysis where we can see that, okay, maybe we don't know exactly what all of the parameters are. Um, 
so we're going to give a distribution of what they might be and we can see how they interact so here we have a, a similar um a similar spread right um blue is no test red is base case and green is test um and we can see that okay so there's certain overlap you know um there if there's if some of the parameters are wrong there might be some cases where we could get similar uh outcomes from different strategies but the centroid for test is still in um in a higher effectiveness range and a lower cost range and this is a little bit to help us dimension what exactly is causing this variation um part of it there there are several parameters um that are used and i will be uh trying to publish this so if you're interested stay tuned um you can get all the parameters uh, you might want uh but one of them is the prior which is um how how what proportion of the firearms in mexico we are assuming are trafficked right so as we can see um as the this proportion goes up uh the base case and the test effectiveness values stay roughly the same base case goes up a little bit um but the no test goes down quite a bit right because we are using um we're using resources inefficiently another one is uh the effectiveness of intelligence agencies Right. So as the effectiveness of um, these intelligence agencies goes up, this increases the test, um, the testing strategy, the effectiveness of the testing strategy um, in a greater proportion to the effectiveness of the base case or the effectiveness of no test. And this is at a fairly low effectiveness. So putting some effort into developing these capabilities would be greatly beneficial in order to um, combat uh, this trafficking. And this is a two-way analysis. So the, um, the blue areas show the probabilities for those two parameters that I just showed, um, where it would be more beneficial to using the testing strategy and the red area shows where it is more beneficial to use the base case. Um, and so in order to wrap this up, um, there are um, so the the two two of the most important uh, points to consider are the uh, prior um prior distribution of uh trafficked arms among all the firearms in mexico and the effectiveness of intelligence agencies um there are some limitations uh like i have mentioned before um there were certain data had to be proxied um and it's difficult of course to know a lot of these parameters for certain but this is why i use decision sciences and uh, different policies should be tested. Uh, this is these are kind of three basic ideas, um, but there's many. There's an infinite uh, realm of other ideas that could be potentially used. And also uh, a point of discussion that I think would be interesting to um, open in general is that is how to increase the effectiveness of intelligence organizations this is a very controversial point um intelligence organizations especially in mexico have a long history of um of not re not respecting the democratic order and uh human rights abuses um so this is something that is being worked on currently it is something that is in the minds of of those leaders but is um is an important thing to bring into this conversation because we need the foresight of intelligence agencies in a way that protects democracy and um human rights 
So that's all I have. Thank you for letting me go a couple minutes over. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think this was super interesting because of because the focus of the security strategy, particularly in terms of the bilateral relation between Mexico and the U.S., has been on stopping drug trafficking or migration, but not firearms, namely stopping firearms to exit the U.S. and being trafficked into Mexico and the rest of the region. So I think this is an amazing uh, effort to try to put the focus on also the, the firearms, which could explain a lot of the violence that we currently see in the region. So thank you. Thank you again. And well, uh, again, last but not least, one, uh, your work on ethnic civilian resistance under criminal territorial control is crucial. Uh, and well, let me start or kick off this, uh, your presentation with one question, and that is how do you or these communi uh, communities navigate the challenges posed by organized crime and what can we learn from, from their experiences? Thank you very much, Juan. Go ahead. Thank you, Jose Pablo, and thank you uh, to the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime for organizing this great uh, panel and the rest of the conference. Um, thank you for the questions that I'm going to answer in the following uh, presentation. So let me share the screen and let me um, yeah, show put this. Okay, so um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about the how some communities, especially in rural areas, are able to resist in nonviolent ways to uh, criminal governance settings in Mexico and Colombia. Uh, this is a interesting topic that I think that the literature on uh, organized crime and criminal governance has not paid too much attention. There are some sort of uh, academic articles about Mexico, but other geographies, which is Colombia, but also Peru and other uh, countries in Latin America deserves this attention. I'm going to show some cases about how nonviolent civilian resistance takes place in, in, in Latin America. Uh, and this is a picture of the indigenous guard in Cauca, in the department of Cauca, south of Colombia. And this is a stick that they use to protect. So they are not, they are not using weapons, as you can see, but instead they use sticks, which is not only a symbolic um, uh, tool, but also means uh, a different connection and a different response to uh, violence in those uh, criminal environments. So um, the objectives for today's presentation are basically to explain some types of these civilian resistance, um, focus on ethnic, um, the ethnic variable. Second, to explain how these communities are able to uh, resist how criminal actors, drug traffickers and others uh, criminal actors uh, want to impose local government populations and in the local governments, populations and territories. And um, finally, to explain these new cases uh, that I'm, I'm mentioning, which is which are indigenous campesina and Cimarron guards in, in Colombia. Um, but for, before us to start, and I think that it's important to define some concepts, which is uh, at least the most important is criminal governance. Uh, criminal governance is um, it's, it's a concept which opposed to rebel governance or insurgent governance and state governance, uh, not only because of the actors that are involved, which are gangs, uh, drug traffickers, and organized criminal groups, but also uh, because of they are somehow uh, connected to the state uh, in many senses uh, for state weakness or also for powerful uh, areas they can be or they can exert uh, criminal governance in prisons, but also they can be present in places with, where the state has a lower uh, capacity. Uh, criminal governance refers to a really basic uh, definition to the imposition of rules or restriction on behavior by criminal organizations. And there are many different things that criminal actors can govern. Uh, mainly, uh, the first one is the criminal organization, the internal members, uh, and second, the community, uh, especially civilian uh, population, which is the focus of this uh, short presentation. Uh, there are other uh, scenarios where these actors can govern, but I'm going to just focus on these civilian and criminal actors relationship. 
And there are different types of criminal governance. I'm not going to talk about the benevolent uh, criminal governance aspect, which is when uh, local populations can get some benefits from, from those actors, where also when the those actors use uh, violence selectively and avoid using violence in, in some cases. But I'm going to focus in the most uh, extreme case, which is predatory criminal governance, where they are perpetrating indiscriminate violence. Uh, it, there are also spaces for disorder and the benefits are, are, are different because of uh, the uh, challenges that these communities uh, faces. So the conventional views of civilian um, of civilians in context of criminal governance uh, basically portrays uh, civilians are victims. They are not able to do anything because of the lethal violence, the threats. They are actually forced to uh, to, to to be displaced, internal or externally. And you, there are many people explain uh, this violence and migration to to other uh, regions. But this is only one of the first uh, conventional views of civilians. Uh, there are other explanations that you can find in literature like, like the Gelantism. Some of these uh, communities are able to organize collectively, especially you have the cases of autodefensas in Mexico that are really well known. And they are fulfilling some of the um, functions that the state are not doing. But what happened when civilians uh, decide to uh, resist these criminal violent context. I think that it's important to uh, offer different views from the classical or conventional ones. This is a picture of the auto defenses in Michoacan. I think that the most uh, famous case of auto defenses and gelantism in 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 Latin America, and by vigilantism, I refer to the collective use of threat of extra legal violence in response to an alleged criminal act. It doesn't have to be a real criminal act, but a supposed uh, criminal act. And here, this uh, graphic uh, show you, shows you uh, how there are uh, different policy organizations, state actors on the one hand, and non-state actors. Uh, I'm focusing here on non-state actors and particularly non-violence ways of ethnic words, but there are also other community groups uh, resistance in these ways. So uh, what I'm trying to show you here is that uh, my, my focus is quite uh, on, on, on really few groups. So this argument, it's not going to apply for other uh, groups. And now uh, talking about the how these groups are are able, uh, it, it's important to acknowledge that uh, confronting criminals it, it it's not always uh, it doesn't it doesn't always carries out extra legal violence. Uh, there are, according to some scholars, uh, acts of everyday resistance against those powerful actors, and um, and this is applied to every place in the world. Uh, Scott did a great job on um, defining in Southeast Asia, but in Latin America, you can find many good examples of how uh, community are resisting to those powerful state and non state actors. So when governments basically fail to um, ensure human security of communities or commit human rights violations, they are violations. They're able to, these communities are able to work together and to provide services that these uh, that they are not receiving from from government. However, the study of resist of resist uh, resistance of criminal rule has been focused only and predominantly in urban areas. There are great studies showing how societal response to violence com comes from uh, really good networks at the urban and cities areas. Uh, at least, for instance, the work of Enrique Desmond Arias uh, showing a uh, great typology in Mexico, in Jamaica, and Colombia. Uh, other scholars have explained how uh, communities are being uh, a resistant extortion, which is one of the most pressing problems in, in the region. But I, I think, and in my research, uh, this work in progress is trying to show that ethnicity and rurality are key important variables that are missing in these accounts. And so the question is, what can explain nonviolent outcomes uh, that are, uh, according to the literature, uh, great good explanations, internal cohesion of those of those groups, 
uh, uh, for the case of ethnic communities, the autonomy regimes and also the customary laws and traditions, it's important uh, in order to organize those groups, um, those civilians, in, and to face the violence exerted by uh, criminal actors. Here, it's also quite important to acknowledge the pre-existing social mobilization or history of mobilization of these groups, which shows that they are able uh, to organize and to resist to the state and non-state actors. And the most recent study about resisting criminal rule, it's a great a paper made by Sandra Ley uh, and colleagues in 2019, showing that translocal networks of cooperation, it's, it helps to apply internal control to the members and external protection uh, and external networks to other groups uh, in the nation and abroad. So the cases uh, that I'm going to show you here, it's uh, the first one are in Mexico, in Guerrero and Guerrero and Chihuahua. Um, these two parts of, of Mexico, the uh, states uh, share similar conditions, geographical conditions because of uh, at least um, these regions in Guerrero and Chihuahua, they have uh, their mountains, they're remote, they're ideal places for marijuana and puppy cultivation. Uh, they also experience the outbreak of the intercultural uh, wars. And then the reaction of the state of the war against drugs in Mexico. So they, they shared these similar conditions. However, in one of these cases, you find uh, communities able to resist the narcos, whereas in other, they were not able to do. And the ex basic explanation, it's this history of mobilizations that at least in Guerrero uh, with the Coordinadora Regional de Autoridades Comunitarias or, or policing, uh, or community policing, they were able to organize, but not only to the 90s and 20,000, but before. Uh, they also got a great important uh, help from leftist secular forces, also the Catholic uh, Church and other progressive state officials that helped to these groups to organize, to build networks, to um, work on, on really important topics, uh, and it, it ultimately uh, helped these uh, communities in Guerrero uh, to show and to resist these, uh, the, the narco rule. The regions of this study, it's Montaña and Costa Chica in Guerrero and Sierra Tarahumara in Chihuahua, and here you see that the main uh, explanation of, of, of a different positive outcome, it's the history of mobilization. If you have history of mobilization of these communities, you can expect a different community, a community role. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't have these uh, pre-existent mobilization, it's, it's very likely that you expect narco rule. But there are other cases of ethnic civilian resistance, and I'm going to show you the cases for Colombia. Uh, there are scarcely torture on, on these groups. Uh, historians and anthropologists have explained very well how these uh, indigenous communities are, are working together in non-violent ways. However, uh, organized crime, criminal justice, political science, sociology, literature has not focused, have not focused on, on these groups. And I think that it's important to acknowledge how they are able to resist places where historical conflicts, where also there are legal and illegal economies, coca crops, uh, the case of, of Cauca, it's emblematic because of the high levels of violence, but also because of uh, how these groups are working. Uh, civilians are resisting several and different groups. Here you can find 10 different armed structures and illicit coca crops, uh, many killings of activists. Uh, Colombia is the deadliest country for activists and environmental defenders. But uh, these, um, these groups are able to uh, resist. And I think that it's important to acknowledge how the constitutions help to organize these groups, at least the indigenous guard, uh, respond to the humanitarian impact of the internal conflict in Colombia. And the other, the Cimarron and the Campesina guards uh, replicate these uh, sort of organization of the guards. Um, so the first case is the indigenous guards. And I know that I'm running out of time. So just one minute to conclude and to provide the yeah the, the final remarks here not only the organization is important but also the relationship again uh with the nature with nature with environment 
uh, they're seeking for collective protection, they are building self-government institutions, and they are following also ancestral self-justice systems. Uh, it's incredible to see how they are using symbolism in order to counter uh, these groups. And basically, uh, these new ways of, of nonviolent uh, strategies are really important to implement, I guess. And, and this is what I wanted to show you for, for this uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Juan. This was very interesting as well. And thank you all, uh, all the panelists for your amazing insights. And before we conclude, we'd like to invite our audience to share your questions and comments. Feel, please feel free to type them into the Q&A tab, not the chat, uh, as well as your name and organization, if you feel comfortable sharing and to which of the panelists your question is addressed. And well, as we start getting the questions from the audience, I'd like to ask you a question, Sarah, if that's okay. And well, one of the significant challenges in combating organized crime, especially in Latin America, lies in addressing the illicit uh, arms trade, um, illicit arms trade. Now, given the legal and political limitation and sens sensitivities around this topic, particularly from major arms producers like the US, how do you propose addressing this matter as well as fostering perhaps international collaboration to regulate and curb the flow of illegal firearms? Thank you very much, Sarah. No, thank you. Thank you for the question, Jose. Um, <clears throat> this is in fact a very, a very difficult problem. Um, I, I decided to focus on a problem that uh, many consider intransible and, um, or, or almost impossible, but, um, it's uh it's the difficulty on the american side the us side pardon me um is that uh the constitution does not allow for a federal determination of arms policy um and it's mostly left up to the states so although there are different there are many sections of the united states that uh are very much against um, having a large amount of firearms within the hands of the population. There are others that are not, and the two cannot legislate. It's very difficult to legislate um, on, on the other. So there's, um, there's that end, which is, uh, I think we are trying to um, develop more policy on the, if you look at uh, certain health policy initiatives, uh, those are um, often directed at controlling um, these firearms within the US because it's that volume that comes into Mexico. Um, but in terms of international cooperation, I've seen that the current uh, Mexican administration has been in talks with about strategies as how to confront that. Um, the the immediate way forward is through talks with individual states. Unfortunately, a, a federalized solution in the US is, is not forthcoming, uh, but hopefully by conquering this problem one piece at a time, and also um, hopefully implementing strategies within Mexico in order to um, stagnate the flow of these illicit arms within the country, um, will start to chip away at the greater issue. Thank you. That couldn't agree more. And well, we're still waiting for a couple of questions. Uh, so let me turn to you, Fausto. And given your experience working with the Mexican government, I believe that offers a unique perspective. And in your opinion and experience, what role should international collaboration and partnerships play in addressing transnational organized crime in Latin America? And how can governments work together to effectively com combat these, these challenges? Thank you, Jose Pablo. Um, well, first of all, I think um, international cooperation should be uh, focused on, uh, well, intelligence sharing. So that's that poses a, a very serious challenge in terms of when when it comes to uh, intergovernment and interinstitutional uh, cooperation, um, especially if the relationship, the bilateral relationship, for instance, um, let's say Mexico and the United States, is not necessarily in its best um, 
shape right now. So uh, one way to uh, further this, uh, the potential of, of inter international cooperation is um, uh, le leveling up the uh, interlocution and um, the, the, the dialogue and, and, and communication uh, uh, aspects of a relationship, particularly in terms of intelligence sharing. And uh, well, the other, I think um, it's important to, uh, well, for instance, um, um, in addition to intelligence sharing, uh, also probably uh, uh, some treaties in terms of extradition, for instance, and uh, the effective application of uh, um, extraditing um, um, criminal uh, leaders of criminal organizations and, of course, um, middle-level members of these criminal organizations. So uh, bottom line, I think I would narrow down my answer in these two aspects, uh, intelligence sharing and um, an effective application of an extradition um, uh, treaty. Thank you. Thank you, Fausto. Uh, there's a question for Juan, uh, which is the following. Does a differentiated relationship with the local state authority play a role in the ability of resistance of these communities in Colombia? Yes, that's a good question. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that it's important to acknowledge that criminal governance, um, it's able to evolve where um, there are some connections at the local level with uh, criminal actors and local powers. So when there are, um, where communities are able to work and build different uh, self-governments institutions that are not related to the local state level, uh, it, it, it helps to shape a more robust uh, resistance organization vis-a-vis -vis these criminal actors and also state actors. Unfortunately, there are strong evidence showing how these criminal actors are related, are quite connected to the state. So groups that have these uh, different regimes and different institutions, um, customer laws and, and other traditions that promote uh, internal cohesions, are, uh, are, it's really important to counterbalance this sort of violence. Um, there are also good cases where local communities are trying to um, to, to help uh, to, and to provide security to citizens. And there are great examples, the Unidad Nacional de Protección, National Protection Agency in Colombia are working with those indigenous uh, guards in order to um, also uh, work together against the violence perpetrated by, by, by criminal actors. But thank you, thank you so much for, for that great question. Thank you, Juan. And Damian, I think we have time for one last question, uh, but we have five minutes left, so if you can be brief. Uh, the question is, considering your focus on innovative qualitative research methods, how can academia and research institutions better collaborate with law enforcement, law enforcement agencies and policymakers to bridge the gap between academia, academic insights and practical actionable strategies in combating organized crime? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, this particular project indeed is a good example of academic uh, researchers uh, with uh, people from law enforcement, the Argentinian federal law enforcement, and also the, inter the, the, um, the Instituto Universitario de Seguridad Marítima, so the university that actually forms the police, uh, where have been also. Um, it is Definitely, in my view, uh, until well, my experience, easier to 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 collaborate with the law enforcement, at least in Argentina at that time, than uh, with other institutions, uh, more political institutions or or or, or economic uh, institutions. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is there is a clear. I mean, related with the methods you you mentioned, yes, this is a qualitative study. They like to to see qualitative studies together, of course, with data collected. Uh, for example, eh, that I did a collection of the day of the data um, base based on all the cases eh, from the ministry. But um, I, my experience in this in this project has been very positive on that on that side and uh, yeah i mean again it's not only fighting crime but also fighting the problems that cause crime and in this is also the issue of illegal 
export of, go of legal goods. So I will leave it there. Thank you, Damian. I think we have time for one last question, if you're a very brief one. Uh, uh, the question is for from Carla M. And she, she asks, to what extent do you think the civilian resistance can be replicated in other areas in Mexico or Colombia? Similarly, to what extent can be the groups in Cauca and Guerrero be trainers to help other groups with civil resistance? Great. I'll start by the second part of this question. Uh, the indigenous guards are helping other guards, the Cimarron, which is after the Sendan guards, and also peasant guards to uh, know the techniques, the strategies to resist in non-violent ways to criminal actors and rebel actors. So yeah, they are these groups, they're these civilians, these ethnic guards are helping other uh, guards in order to resist these uh, violent actors. Uh, and the first part of the question is so difficult because you need to uh, uh, exhibit at least social historical uh, mobilization and also different sort of uh, customary laws in order to uh, yeah, organize these groups. So I think that it's complicated to replicate uh, when you don't have the ethnic aspect of, of this organization. It's, it's the game changer, the ethnicity here. It's what makes possible that these groups are able to resist. But thank you, Carla, thank for this great question. Thank you, Juan, and all of you. Uh, I think we've run out of time, but in closing, I want to extend my gratitude to all of our panelists for their valuable con contribution and insights on organized crime in Latin America. I would also like to extend uh, my gratitude to the organizers, particularly the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, but above all to our listeners and participants, your engagements and insights make, the, make these discussions truly meaningful. So thank you all again. And uh, well, there's the information from all the panelists in these uh, talk um, website. So thank you again and hope to see you soon and keep the conversation going. Thank you.